I have been wanting to cover how to make your own image from a Docker file for a while now, but I've only become recently comfortable enough to relay how it's done. So we're going to talk about how to write your own Docker file. And originally I envisioned this being all encompassing. We would jump into the basics, the understanding, the terminology, then we dive into an example and do a build. Unfortunately, that will be a huge episode, so we're going to break this into two parts. I'm going to use this episode as a Docker file primer. We're going to talk a lot about the basics of a Docker file, what's in it, how do you use it, the terminology, some of the code. And then next time we meet, we'll talk about how to go through and write one. We'll tear apart some examples that I have. We'll build one together and you can see how it works. And if you're here because you don't know anything about Docker and you need the basic 101 course, this is the wrong episode. I do have a video on a Docker primer, which is going to cover the very basics of how to move around and what it is. I have an episode after that on installing a Docker image of developer C and how to get it up and running. This is going to be about a use case I had at work of wanting to spend up my own image that had an install of DB2 with a specific database with a specific configuration. So let's go over to the slides and I'll start walking you through the basics of a Docker file. Do you remember what I mentioned in a previous Docker episode that one Docker file leads to an image which then can be spun into one or multiple containers? Well, that's still the case when we're talking about Docker files and building an image, but I did fib a little bit. And that's because there actually can be a couple pieces to building an image. You will always need a Docker file. That's, there's no exception there. However, you may have an entry point script that is called from the Docker file, or even one or many other scripts that are called from the Docker file that will then be compiled into your image and eventually become containers. So why did I stretch the truth? And that's because you can do everything you want in one Docker file. But when you get to the essence of Docker, which is trying to build an image that is highly reusable with very little configuration after the fact, you're going to find that you get simplistic on your initial image or that Docker file and that it will become a building block for things later on. So coming from my perspective on my most recent task at work, I had a goal where I wanted to build an image that would install DB2 create a database and apply some configuration changes that are consistent across any database regardless of what it is and then apply specific configuration changes that are only for WebSphere Commerce. And when I took a look at it that way I realized I had three distinct needs. And although my very first image was from a single large Docker file, as it matured it broke up into three parts. And here's an example. The Docker file became the lowest common denominator, that is my base image. When it came straight down to it, what was the simplest thing that I needed done? And that was always install DB2 and get some file systems mounted. That was it. After that, I would be making configuration changes. So I broke out my configuration changes into an entry point script and even an additional script after that. The ones that were common across all databases regardless became my entry point script where my WebSphere Commerce configuration changes were broken out to a third external script. So the Docker file called the entry point, the entry point called the external script. That allowed me to flip and flop and put things together and take them apart to build different images if I wanted to. If I wanted to just have a base install of DB2, I had my Docker file. If I wanted a base install of DB2 with a plain old database and a couple configurations, well then I would manipulate and make some edits. So all I had to do was compile my Docker file and my entry point. So I think you can see the logic in breaking up your tasks 
into multiple different areas. Essentially keep your Docker file simple, as simple as possible, and then any configuration should come out after the fact. So let's talk about what is in a Docker file. Essentially what makes it go? A Docker file is a constant list of read-only commands that are going to be applied one after another. Basically Docker is going to take a look at the delta and apply the next line. Take a look at the delta and apply the next line and compile your final image. So let's take a look at it from a DBA perspective or I'm trying to make my image with my database in it. What do I need to do to do that task? Well, if you were coming at it just manually installing, you would end up looking up to see what requirements were needed and installing any requirements. I would sit there and go get my tar file that I know I need to uh, expand. I'm going to create file systems like slash opt. So this is everything that was inside my Docker file. Get the requirements that are needed, get the tar file I need, create my file systems I needed, make them persistent, which I'll talk about in a minute, and expose a port. So I had 50,000 always open instead of having to put it in an extra command line on launch. And then my call to my entry point script to go do everything I wanted after the fact. There are a couple common Docker file commands. Uh, you'd be surprised how few different or unique commands you're gonna use. They're just strung together and usually repetitive. The first was a little confusing to me and that is the from command, which is at the very top of your Docker file. And this is basically saying what other image am I using as my base state? So in my example, you were going to see that I said, go get the sent OS image and use that as my operating system for everything else that we're about to do from here on out. You will find that it is extremely rare that you do something called from scratch, which means I have nothing to work from. Most people are always gonna end up using from and then some other image. Run is self-explanatory, that's gonna execute execute whatever command you're trying to do, whether it's untar a file or just changing a directory. Copy. This was a little confusing at first. When you are using copy, it's because you are bringing along a file that you want rolled into your image. And that makes sense. If you think about it, I need a tar file. So there's going to be a command that says copy the tar file that's on my local client and copy that file into the image because later on I have to untar it and then install from it. Volume. Volume is going to be essentially file systems you want to mount into your container and it provides persistence. That means that this will not be destroyed when the container is stopped and started. I want to stop and talk about volume persistence for a minute. If you take a look at the essence of Docker, again, you go back to the fact that anything built by Docker is transient. I meant to put it up and tear it down and destroy it. So if you have a container and you've started it and it either abnormally ends or you stop it and then you bring it back up again, you basically lost any changes that you made to your container that you had launched. To stop this, you deal with volume persistence, which basically says, this is essentially mounted like you would mount on a server and this area, this disk over here, will be here every time regardless on if the container stops, ab ends, and, and comes back. So that data that you have in your POC database that's supposed to be around for a month, I want to protect that. From a DBA perspective, I had to come in and go, well, what do I make persistent and what do I not make persistent? Do I really care? I only want to protect this area, but not that area. I started to work through it in piecemeal and I ended up going, well, I definitely know I need my data protected, so I'm going to make that persistent. Well, I may want to make my logs persistent in case I have to recover because we're two weeks into this thing. Well, then do I need to take backups? Well, maybe I need to make that persistent. Well, I want to practice a DB2 upgrade, so I probably need to make OPT persistent. And I found as I worked through it, I ended up just making any major file system I normally would use persistent. That way I know it will always be there if the container is stopped and restarted. And if I really want to get rid of everything, I'm going to blow away the container completely.
expose what port do you want listening uh, off the bat when it's spun up and then entry point which will specify what entry point you're going to use as the next script to continue going so what happens when I start stringing these together well you need to minimize your overhead remember what I had mentioned before that a docker file is basically stringing together a bunch of read-only commands one on top of the other with deltas and you're essentially making layers to a cake and each layer adds overhead so let's take something simple like I need to untar a file and then execute it so the first thing I would do is change into the directory I want to work in which is a little bit of overhead and then once I'm there I'm gonna untar the tar file which is a little bit more of our overhead and then I'm going to do the DB2 install which is another layer in the cake and even more overhead and overall if I am doing a command at a time like this am I gonna cause a ridiculous amount of slowdown or overhead no but yes in a way it's something you want to get in the habit of of how can I reduce my overhead for when I'm doing my my build command and there's a, a quick workaround that's really easy and it involves stringing your commands together so if I take those same commands and I end up breaking them up but then I tie them together with the double ampersand I can put a string of commands together that will equal one layer of the cake instead of three now sometimes that's a little hard to use so you are able to use another syntax which will allow you essentially to wrap the line down to the next level and you can do that over and over and over again so you'll see in my example where I'm issuing the yum install command and I'm applying a bunch of packages that are prereqs it'll be yum install and then a backslash on my first line the next line will be package one I need slash package two I need slash package three I need so the command actually looks ugly because it's 20 lines long but it's easier to read in a simple command how do I actually build the image the build command is fairly simple it's docker build your options and your path your options can have things like hey use this for my HTTP proxy before you have to go out and get some of these packages it could be add this tag to the build so I can refer to it later and then you're going to specify your path but if you're in the directory that contains all the files you need you can just use a dot so what needs to be there well when I issue that build command anything that you need that was called in that docker file needs to be residing in the directory so in my docker file where I am installing DB2 I needed to have my docker file of my commands I needed to have my entry point script which was going to be called later to do some creation of a database and basic configuration I had to have an additional second script there that was used for applying scripts for WebSphere commerce configuration I had my DB2 installation tar file which I was going to copy and uncompress and install and then any other file that you need to be in that image when it is spun up it's not complex the building is actually the simple part it's getting everything right in your docker file to build a proper image well now you have the basics we speak the same language you understand the terminology and the high level overview that's enough to get us started so when we meet next week we're actually going to take a look at a docker file I wrote as well as some entry point scripts I can show you why I did what I did I can show you some pitfalls to watch out for and we will end up compiling an image together so you can see why we do what we do I hope you found this useful and I'll look forward to seeing you next week